Ready? Let's do this. Okay, well, I think I've uh, introduced Gergé a couple of times, but I shall do it once more to make sure we get him nice and appropriately embarrassed. But um, Gergé is, as I said before, now a very, very, very well-known engineering blogger. I like to call him the Ben Thompson of the engineering world to, to really make him blush. Yeah, you should copyright that one. <laughs> exactly. So. Um, Today, um, Gergé and I are going to run through a few themes. We've got some high-level bits and pieces. We're going to leave a bit of time at the end of this for questions, but Gergé also has a session later on where um, he's going to speak... Um, well, we, we just changed the topic at the moment. Yeah, because we do that. <laughs> exactly. So we mix it up. It's a little bit different from the original agenda, but instead what he's going to do is not have a moment. Back. Hello? Okay. Um, instead, we're going to have a talk, and then we're going to leave more time for questions. So if you don't get a chance, I know loads of the engineers want to ask very specific things, which is great. If you don't get a chance in this session, you will get another chance later on, okay? Okay, perfect. So, Gogo, you have had, again, a super interesting background. You started off in engineering, and you started, you, you began, what, at JP Morgan originally? Yeah, so I, I worked at, I'm actually originally from Hungary, so... Which uh, I, I, is one of, one of the things of being from a smaller country, and even from Europe. Like, is anyone here from the U.S.? Hands up. We, we have a few people, but I, I always had this feeling, like when I when I grew up, like now when I look at where I'm, I'm now, it's it's kind of a dream because I'm from a small country at a place that English is not the main language. Is and I, as as I was growing up, all the technology innovation was coming from the U.S. I, I used Microsoft Windows. I, I used all this thing, and I never thought that. I would be doing these things, you know. I, I read the things about Bill Gates, whatnot, and I think this is true for a lot of us. And I think one of the big things that that has, just look, looking back at, at what I, I've done, is just how the world has kind of evened out in terms of knowledge, in terms of building cool stuff anywhere. So yeah. So be, before I, I moved to the UK, I, I worked at small. I worked at the small, terrible Hungarian company, the the place where like. You, it will be like a coin toss if your salary did arrive on the salary day or a week later. Uh, and then I, I moved to the UK where I worked at a, a, a small financial consultancy, uh, which, which uh, was, was a pretty cool experience. And then it was JP Morgan. It was, it was really interesting because you would think like a small financial consultancy in Edinburgh versus JP Morgan, which one's better? I mean, JP Morgan pays a lot better. They're a lot better brand. The financial consultancy was so much more fun. Like, and it's, it's just crazy because uh, I think throughout my career, uh, I've, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about what I did, but it's just a series of like aha moments of like, oh, I had no clue this is how things work. And uh, I, I started to blog about some of these things on the way, so that's probably what some of you are reading. Um, and so you started there, it was a bit of a, you know, you weren't really in what you would call high tech at that stage. What was the inflection point? When did you nudge over and why? Yeah, so. I always tinkered on the side, and I always built like like just side projects. Like throughout throughout my my basically after after university, I, I like basically until I had kids. Like I would just stay up until one a.m. and just do crazy stuff that I, I thought was important. But it and it was important, by the way. I built a really cool cocktail website with my brother a while back, and and I I always read the the news, and this is still like. Like old me, kind of just looking, hopefully, of like, how is everyone else doing these amazing things? And I read about the iPhone uh, apps just going crazy, people making million dollars with the farting app. Well, actually, this is actually off, tangentially off that. There's quite a funny story, which I'm going to drag you onto for yeah, sure. And, and I'm, I'm, I know which story you're dragging onto. But so, maybe you should ask them who, like, maybe a guess, who can guess how many downloads, and anybody who had dinner with Gergi is not allowed to answer this. How many downloads? Put your hands up if you think like we're gonna go get built an app, a random little app for, for Windows Phone. Uh, put your hands up if you think he had above one million downloads. Okay. Keep your hands up if you think it was above five million. And I assess the new hands. So that, that, that's, that's where it was, and this actually led me into Microsoft. I was I was building this this just websites on the side on all, all all these cool things, and then Windows Phone came out, and I I was thinking I was in the Microsoft ecosystem, I did C sharp and some of those things, and I thought like here's my chance. I miss iPhone, I miss Android, but Windows Phone is out. They had a launch event in the UK where you could just get your hands on devices like two months before the launch, and I decided like all right, for the launch I'm gonna build like an, a farting app. Well, not not exactly. 
but then I, I kind of rephrase it. I, I, I wanted to build an app that people would just use. And we built a really cool cocktail app with my, with my brother, which people, we got known well for it uh, after a while. But the other thing that I did, I looked at, like, I just looked at with the analytical eye, what are the apps that people are going to use that is missing from the app? And cl clearly there's a farting app, which, you know, we'll get back to there's a weather app. And there was a flashlight. Windows Phone did not have a built-in flashlight. They had an LED, but, but no flashlight. So I, I knew this is going to be a miss, and I knew what most people will do. They'll just do a white screen as a, as a flashlight. But there, there was clearly an API. It just wasn't exposed on the official documentation. But you know, C Sharp having reflection, I just back traced. I found the API uh, and I was able to invoke it with because they they allowed it on, on like for example iOS. And I submitted on the App Store to launch day. Now this was clearly against store guidelines, so it, it was it was explicitly written. But I think Microsoft by that time realized it's just friggin' embarrassing to not have a flashlight app. So yeah, uh, I uh, my app was. The first flashlight that actually you could work as a flashlight. So almost every Windows Phone user got it until people started copying it. So 15 million downloads later <laughs> on Windows Phone. To put that in perspective, 15 million downloads on a flashlight. But it kind of comes back to Matt's point, right? Like build something that people actually want. It doesn't matter whether it's a farting app, a flashlight app, or a direct debit collection company. Like do something that people need, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely, and 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 so and this was the inflection. We talked about how did I move into big tech. I was building my Windows Phone apps happily on the side and like giving 50 million downloads and, and like getting some ad revenue, like which was like from fifty dollars to three thousand dollars a day. Microsoft, the three thousand dollars was Microsoft made a bug for a week where they just ten x or twenty x all earnings and they owned up for it. So they paid me fifteen thousand dollars and I, I was making in the in the UK like you know four thousand pounds a month. So I was like, oh, maybe I should go and <laughs> maybe I should quit my job. I, Maybe I should have. Uh, but I, I was doing this, and I was working at a bank. Uh, and I, I was getting all these opportunities like for contracting. Everyone wanted to hire contractors. I, I've never been a contractor myself, so I, I didn't really understand. And this, this included just like some career advice. I, I know we're kind of totally going off, off tangent here, but a little bit of career advice to all of you, and Charles, Charles, don't kill me from this, but if you ever get, like if you build something cool and people pay attention, and a founder reaches out to from, from this really small startup who just raised $8 million of Series A in the US, and they have a funny title, let's say Chief Pete's Officer, because this was the title of this guy, and they just write, it's the opportunity, this career opportunity, and it says like, hey, I liked your app, do you want to talk? Do not do what I did, which is tell them, sorry, I'm too busy. Especially not, if you, if you ask your friends, have you heard of this app, it's some random app, and they say like, yeah, I, oh, I love it, I use it all the time. So uh, my life could have been very different if I would have responded to the chief peace officer called Jan Combe of this tiny app called WhatsApp that my wife was already using, who was hiring the first ever Windows Phone developer. And uh, this only resonated with me four, four years later. So I was still at JP Morgan. And to my luck, uh, uh, Skype reached out saying, we can tell you what we're working on, but since we're in Europe and not in US, we can tell you. It's the new Xbox One, which is going to be just like Windows Phone, basically the programming ecosystem. We know you're doing all this cool stuff. Do you want to build it with us? And at this point in, in, in my career, again, I, I'm kind of someone who just went with the flow for a long time, and I was super happy. Like I didn't think too much of the WhatsApp thing because they were still not bought by Facebook for uh, like an eye-watering amount of money. Uh, and I, I didn't feel sorry for myself, you know, sulking and eating ice cream for like a night. <laughs> that, that did not come yet, but, but it would. But I was actually really happy at JP Morgan. Like I felt really happy. I was making a really good salary. I, I had access to internal training tools and I learned about the Black Schools model of finance. I, I, actually, I actually was happy, honestly. Like I had a really supportive team, a really supportive manager, and I was building these cool apps on the side and I just, I just found it weird that no one else was talking about these things with me. So I mean, my one takeaway from that is that we need a chief pizza officer to help us with recruitment. Yep, you definitely need a chief pizza officer. So from that, you moved over. You were then in, in tech, and then obviously we started working together a couple of years later, which was a strange, inter or strange change for you, given the circumstances. Yep, so I, 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 I spent some time at, at Skype. I didn't say Skype, it was Microsoft. It was, it was pretty much big tech. We were, we were building a product that would be used by a million people on day one, and it was, and then we built Skype for what was well. And it was this big organization, solely became Microsoft. But I, I, I got to reach out, and this was the, the time where I started to listen to my own advice. When a founder reaches out to you and you're working at a cool job, talk to them. So I talked with Ross, who, who, has, who started, just got acquired, and, and he actually told me that they're working on something exciting. And 
like my career has kind of alternated. When people look at back my, my career path, I, I worked at starting from JP Morgan, Skype, uh, later Skyscanner, and Uber. It's like you would think it's like a perfect thing, but I always just kind of followed things that seemed really interesting and more challenging than before. And the reason I joined, I, I, I joined like this startup within a startup. It was like, wow, I could build something from scratch that we think is going to change the world, like a B two B travel company where you can do self service, and it'll be called Travel Perk. <laughs> Pro. Like no. We had to change the name, and now here we are. So, sort of, it's full circle for both of us. It was quite funny for you watching the whole thing earlier. It was a bit nostalgic seeing the same sort of. Yeah, it's been a been a long journey that sort of tends to go around. But so from there, you then moved on, and then you started running Uber Payments, right? Well, payments for Uber. Yep. And I'm so I, I I joined an Uber who were somehow they decided to move payments out of all things to Amsterdam with a very small team, and when when I joined Uber that. Group was processing about like five hundred or like maybe three four hundred million dollars a month, uh, and by the time I left, it was more like five or six billion dollars, and we grew from about twenty people in the office to one hundred and fifty plus. And my my team also grew from when I joined. I joined as a senior engineer, and I quickly became an engineering manager, and then a manager of managers. So it grew into a group of like thirty or so people, and all the money was throwing, all the money through Uber was flowing through us, and that was also really. Interesting to see because when, when when you don't work at these big companies and you know like Travel Perk is becoming now a big company, but from the outside you assume that it must be rocket scientists building all these really critical systems, and you go inside and it's just held together by friggin' duct duct tape. Like you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> but it also gives you confidence that you can do it. And so so now like whenever I hear from a startup founder and we had we had Matt earlier here, but like so someone just raised sixty billion dollars, uh, sorry sixty million dollars, and and then they're worth like three hundred million or something like that. I, I know that they're probably like running the whole business off of Google Sheets, probably. So who showed him Travel Desk? Like. <laughs> Anyway, so <laughs> moving swiftly on from that, so then you uh, had another little moment where a side project started to gain traction. This time it wasn't a flashlight or a farting app, but something new. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Are we talking about the blog? We're talking about the blog, yeah. And yep. Is there something else that you want to share with the audience here? Right. <laughs> So it's open, asking open-ended questions can get to weird places. No, we're we're, we're, we're going skip to skip to the, the script now. Yeah, and so actually, the I started my blog while I was at Skyscanner, and I don't think Ross even noticed. So, yeah, see, he, he, he just figured it out. I, I wrote my, my my first blog post. So what I did is, is I, I've been blogging on and off for like since since I came out of school. I had this personal blog where I just wrote stuff. And it didn't have like I wrote about my debugging adventures and some of those things, but it it never was really something that had a theme. And after like somehow when when I when I joined Skyscanner, I read this blog post from Joel. Um, Joel's, uh, it wasn't from Joel's post. It was from Jeff Atwood, the co-founder of, of uh, Stack Overflow, who had this really popular blog ten years ago called Coding Horror. And he said like the very simple way to become famous on the internet is just write every. Every, like three times a week for a year, and I guarantee you'll be internet famous. And I, I was like, you know what? I'm. I actually, I don't want to be internet famous, but I want to see if people can read what I'm interested, what I write about. I started the blog. I said I'm going to publish every every month for like six months or so, and I did. I wrote one article, and it's going to be on on engineering topics that I'm actually I want I want to read. And I wrote for myself, and for a long time, no one read it. About a year or a year and a half later, someone submitted one of the articles to Hacker News, and that's the first time I noticed that hey, people are actually interested in this. But the point was for for a very long time, I just wrote for myself. I wrote about stuff that I wanted to read, and I didn't care too much about it. And in hindsight. Me, me doing that five years ago has actually led to where I am, where I'm now a full-time writer. I was able to leave Uber and do stuff that is really cool and get paid for it and actually talk with cool people and just get ideas that I wouldn't otherwise have. Well, it was super interesting how this event came together. Is that, um, I, think it was, I think maybe four or five different people in the team at different points shared your articles with me. No idea of the background or anything like this. And as looking at that, I was like, "Oh my God, Gergi's getting internet famous! Like, what, what's going on here?" So I gave you a ping, and then obviously you decided. But what will be very interesting, I think, for the, the team as well: how do you pick these topics? It's things that you're interested in, but how do you, when you go through that, like, what comes to mind? Are you just picking random things? Is there a system to it? Like, I, I write down things when I have ideas, and, and this is this is something that like. 
I, I think writing comes down to like three different phases. One is idea generation. And what I found is ideas come anywhere. And I, I just have my phone on me. I, I have an app, like a to-do note, and I make a note saying, huh, this, this could be something interesting. And it usually comes when I talk with people. We, ha we have a big debate. Uh, or, or when I find myself repeating the same point again. So for example, I wrote an article on how I think software architecture is just overrated. And that came after I was talking with someone. I was, we were talking about a chief architect at a different company who was a very old school type of architect. And I'm like, we don't need more of that. And I, I think like, it's just so overrated, like all these UML patterns. Like I haven't used them since university. And we got into this debate and I, I just made an old like, oh, actually, maybe I could write something about this. So whenever I felt myself becoming passionate or, or getting into or learning something. So I kind of make, make a note. And then the second part is writing. Uh, this is what I, I found that, and, and by the way, like one thing that you all should try is just write a bit more because it'll help you the very least. Like you're, you'll just organize your thoughts better. I usually just sit down, you know, get, get some space, get, get to something that I like, sometimes put on some, some, some sort of music, and I, I kind of take an idea and I do what I call free writing. So I just kind of turn off my inner critic and I just write down the stuff that I think about. And the third one is, and, and you get a bunch of stuff. Like it's a lot of junk as well, but it doesn't matter. You just kind of don't stop. And the third part is editing. So like once you have it, it's kind of there. Editing is very different. You turn it into something that people want to read. So for example, I pay a lot of attention. I think why you might enjoy reading some of my posts is I set the context in the front. I tell you what you'll expect. And you'll stop reading if it's not that. In the end, I make a point to bring it home. I, I remove duplication and some of those things. So it's, it's kind of crystallizing. And these are three different stages. But the first two, you can do anytime. So take notes of some ideas you have when you have a discussion with someone that you're, you, know, you really got into. Just make a note. Take some time to write about it, and then you know. And then for the last one, just show it to a couple of people. Uh, do some some edit, like, put on a critical eye. And I found that writing and editing is very different uh, in, in in terms of you just need different things. Because with editing, you kind of chop things. It's a bit like writing. Uh, when you're writing code, uh, you know, first of all, you get an idea of what you're, the work you want to do. You create a ticket somewhere, you put it away for later. You then write like a, a super ugly solution that barely works, but it works, and you show it to someone like, yes, it works. And then finally, refactoring. So it's pretty similar. Very cool. Well, just sort of changing topic a little bit, so flowing from that. Um, a lot of the things that you write about tend to be, I guess, um, patterns and general behaviors that are beginning to be adopted as sort of a playbook that comes from usually like the West Coast of the US. How are you beginning to see that playbook establish? And how are you beginning to see it bleed over into Europe? Are you seeing a big change? And what's your thoughts around that? I, I'm I'm luckily seeing a change. I, I can never tell how much of it's, it's my bubble, like because I, I write about things that I see, and then people tell me things. So I don't know if it's just people who are doing the same thing. But one thing is for sure: if we look at the most successful tech companies, I, I'm just gonna take it really easy, really simple. What is successful? Let's look at market cap in terms of how much those companies are worth, uh, or you know, brand, how much you know about them. Almost all of them are from the U.S. Like like these days, the pre-IPO companies, Stripe or Coinbase or Robinhood. And you also see a pattern that there's founded in, in Silicon Valley. And you, you, there are some, a few success stories in Europe, but I think it's very small compared. You look at the number of people, it's 300 million in the US, 500 million in Europe, and you know, there's, there's all these people in Africa and Asia. There's very small compared to the rest of it. So it begs the question, what are they doing differently? And when I worked at Uber, the, really, the best experience I had at Uber is we worked in Amsterdam, but I, I felt like a complete equal to San Francisco and to Palo Alto and those people. And I, I worked with them a lot. I, I flew over, and they were the same people, like, like, like no, no difference at all, which was crazy. So this gave me the idea or the conviction that the people are the same. Like, you know, any one of you is capable of doing the same thing that that engineer in San Francisco uh, or at Menlo Park at Facebook is doing. So what's getting in the way? And I think a lot of things that's getting in the way is, first of all, in Silicon Valley, like people just get tech. Like the, the people who are, who are the CTOs or the CEOs ha have, have done it. In Europe, there's, in some places, they just don't have that. And they understand that tech software engineering, design. Actually, design and software engineering are very similar. They're very creative fields. And if you try to lock someone in a cage, they'll do work, right? Like they'll, you give them a typewriter and tell them what to do, they'll do it. But if you just leave them a pen and pencil and an open, open room or even better, a whiteboard, they'll come up with a bunch of better stuff. And this goes back to a lot of things that I'm, I'm writing about and I'm trying to explain. And I, 
I'm very selfish. I just want Europe and the rest of outside of Silicon Valley to be a really fun place to build companies so that we don't all have to move, so we don't so the wages also go up. And we're just really happy staying on our bums and knowing that, you know, we're, we can build the next Facebook from here as well. So that's kind of one of my drives of, of doing this. And also, it's, it's kind of fun to talk about these things. Uh, that, so that's super interesting. What's one of the, like, you've got the behaviors of the org that you think is a bit different, but there's also, you kind of touched on it around pay, right? There's a big mentality difference between the US and Europe that's beginning to change. What's, what's your view on that? Because you write a lot about this topic. Yeah, and, and pay is something that I, I find it really interesting because I, I always say that American people talk a lot more about pay and they look at me like, are you kidding me? We don't talk about it at all. I'm like, well, just come to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you'll see how people talk. And, and it is important because I think like a, a lot of things, like w w when you think about the stuff that should be important in your life, but you actually don't prioritize it as, you know, you probably sleep the most, so your mattress should be the most important, but probably most of you don't, pr don't spend as much money on it as, as you could. Or uh, the, the, the other one is your workplace, the, how, much, how much time you spend. And obviously the money that you get and what you do with that money and what you do with your free time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those, these are kind of like on, on the spot. But what I think is a big difference in the US is how they don't just talk in tech, people no longer think about salary as pay. They think about compensation where equity and bonuses are a big part of it. And especially in this really fast growing tech world, um, equity is just so damn important. Equ equity is the way to go from having equity in a, in a fast growing startup is the way to actually have enough money so that when the company goes public, suddenly you, you might get a few years worth of salary in your bank account just like that. And what's the change that you tend to, because I think it could be that, why, why, why do you think that is, there's that, that mentality difference? Is it that we haven't got examples here in Europe yet? That, you know, there's not social proof on it? Is it that the concept is culturally a bit more alien, like you said, between here and the US? What's your view on why that, that exists? It, it's, it's two things. One, one is lack of examples. So like in the US, there are some people who don't know about equity and they typically live in areas where their friends have never been exposed. And, and a lot of the equity, equity, equity comes from the West Coast and some of them on the East Coast where people, they have friends who have been at the Google IPO, the Facebook IPO. You know, th those friends have now bought like these massive houses and are driving around these like stupidly expensive cars. And you're, and you're they are like, how much money do you have? And they're like, I, I don't, I don't want to tell you. And then they tell you and then you feel bad because you should have just not asked at all. <laughs> But the crazy thing is that the thing that, and, and by the way, like the whole equity situation is insane. Like I'm just going to take a step back from tech. As an employee who does not take any risk, you're not risking your house on a company, you should not be able to make obscene amounts of money for sitting on a desk doing the job that, well, doing a pretty good job, by the way, but just doing that because that's what typically founders have done. Like if, if you cut a line from like 1970, before that you, you needed to have like old money to like risk all that money to make a lot more money. We are in this crazy time, which I don't know how long it'll last, but it's not gonna last forever. I'll tell you that for sure. It, the only reason people are getting equity uh, in, in the US, and now it's slowly creeping to Europe as well, because companies have to do it, because otherwise people would just not join. So this is this really cool opportunity where if you're in a fast growing company, uh, it's a bit tricky because, uh, for example, if, if you're in this company or if, if you've not worked at a company that went public, you might think, ah, equity, funny money, paper money, whatever money. When I joined Uber, I, I, I got a bunch of equity, which was paper money, and I always treated it as zero, but it was a pretty large number, and when Uber went to IPO, it just arrived in my bank account all at fucking once. <laughs> and and I, I read about this, but, but then it just became real. And, and I'll be honest, one of the reasons that I could quit Uber and say, I'm just gonna write for a while, is because I had, I, I, I had enough money to not have to work for a few years. And this was because equity. And I negotiated for equity because I read about it and I had this belief that Uber must go public. They cannot not go public. So it's, 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 it's a bit of a risk. And what I do suggest to people is don't just say, I'm, don't just you know, go for equity. Don't join a company where they only give you equity. Yes, get a salary, get a, get a good salary. Companies these days are, are, are paying good. And uh, I hope you, know, you guys are, are no different, but you have to keep up with the market. So you do that. But on top of it, so it's not an or, it's an and. And if you're seeing that a company is doing well, if you're seeing the numbers that you're seeing here, um, people like to sometimes move jobs, but sometimes it's worth sticking around for that financial event, which is the IPO. And then some people stick around longer as well, but this is changing. IPOs are coming to Europe. I had, I'll, I'll give you an example, which 
might, might, might exemplify how people are thinking differently. In the UK, there's this engineer at TransferWise who got 80,000 pounds worth of stock. Um, this was this was four or five years ago, over four years, so like 20,000 pounds worth of stock per year, but it's not liquid. And they actually wanted to negotiate for 5,000 more pounds salary to not get any stock, because they're like, it's just funny money. And they didn't let him. They actually had him take that 80,000. And by the time they went public, he actually made 800,000 pounds because TransferWise won 10x in value. He joined when they were a billion and they won public at, at like 13 billion and there was some delusion and all. But he, he messaged me saying, I just cannot believe this happened. I did not realize, like I, I made, it, it's, it's just insane. And, and the point is, I don't think you should count on this. You know, like let's, I, I don't think it's just good to always fixate in these big numbers. But the point is, there's an opportunity in the tech industry and companies that issue equity are going to share this obscene amount of wealth that is created for the investors, for the founders, and for some, some of the employees, which I think is great. And the reason I, I, I benefit and I, I always help negotiate people like for free, uh, for equity and, and salary, because I think it helps everyone. The more people are well off and, and you can decide to quit your job or, or, or to stay on, you might create a startup or you might stay on and, and you'll just have less pressure and you'll do even better and more fun work. Uh, so what else do you think um, beyond that starts to make an amazing engineering culture? Like when you've looked at a lot of companies, you, you advise quite a few companies, and you've done in and out of things. You know, but what, what's the common patterns that you see of workplaces you think of, uh, have great engineering cultures? I mean, the biggest one is uh, I, I could throw on like big words that you'll sometimes see in my blog, but I try not to. I try to be pretty simple. It's the place where you go in there and people are motivated. It's it's where where you go in motivated, like. Every day, or most days, except when you're having like really bad days for you know the outage or whatever that happened. But you, you go in there and you're like, I think this is a great place. Like I feel I'm learning, I feel I'm growing, and I feel I'm giving the space to do all of that. And it goes a little bit back to autonomy. It's it's a place where you feel you can do stuff, you can try stuff, you can learn new stuff. You work with smarter people, and those smarter people are here because they also get that autonomy. So it, it, it goes back to autonomy, it goes back to learning, and it goes back to not having too heavyweight processes. Obviously, we, we need to have processes, right? We can't let production go down, right? As, as we're talking, people need to use the service. But, but ha having that flexibility, and uh, this goes back to feeling as a partner. Uh, a good analogy that I really, I really, really felt, uh, I, I, I said I liked working at JP Morgan, but when Skype reached out and said, like, you could work here, like I, I just didn't sleep the next two nights because I was tossing and turning, and I was thinking, "What if?" And I was asking, "Why am I feeling like this?" I, I, I have a great manager; they're supportive. I got a good bonus. What's missing? What was missing is like now I can verbalize it. I was a cost center. Like we were called IT. Uh, we were kind of always last in line. Uh, the traders were running the show. Like the trader, when the trader said something, they immediately went. So work at a company where. Software engineering is a profit center. You're generating business roles. When you have an idea, you can actually bring in a lot of money and people will listen to you. It's an awesome place to be. If you find yourself in a cost center, you know, if you can, try to get out and go to a profit center. And again, I think this is also one of the big shifts that's now happening is that a lot of European companies are now stopping thinking about tech as a, as a line item. Like, and they're shifting over to becoming or understanding that it's the engine room, building room of the business. Um, so you, you, you um, like Matt, you sort of touched on the fact that it's the people, the motivation, things like this. I'm going to ask you a similar question to see if you have different, maybe contrasting answer. But when you think about, you've done a huge amount of bringing in people and hiring and structuring that process. What do you look for in fantastic engineers? What's your mental model for identifying great people? Yeah, this is. I, I've been thinking a lot about like on how we do hiring, and it's it's really. Like Matt said, it's the cliche of hiring is hard. I think a lot of you, especially software engineers, we love to criticize the hiring process, especially for big tech. Oh, lead code. Oh, I have to practice coding. I'm a senior engineer. Why do I need to solve algorithms? And I'm going to tell you from the other side, it's I, I'm, I'll, I'll talk about software engineering hiring like for the most part. Uh, we can talk about managers, but we can take that maybe. If, if you want to talk about manager hiring, just find me afterwards. Hi, the really, really interesting of hiring software engineers. Matt, Matt said, like, it's hard to hire a marketing person because they'll just mar marketing themselves. And with software engineers, if you hire someone, they're going to code like 50% of the time or 30% of the time, depending on that. It's the only field where you can actually measure that. Like and Matt said, the best way to, to get a marketing person, have them do their work. And that's what we're doing. So I, I don't know of any work, workaround than 
having someone code because it turns out in software references are, are garbage. People, well, the references are not garbage. They're, they're, they're actually decent, but they're very late in the process. People talking about themselves and their projects. I've, I've seen so many people who were great and until they needed to write some code and, and they just froze. It wasn't that they froze. They, they just didn't have the skills. So it's really easy to talk into that. So like coding will, I think, always be there for better or worse because you don't want to have colleagues who don't work out. The other thing with hiring that is its scale. So what a lot of people who complain about hiring practices don't realize is companies, like, it, it is always a company's market. The company has a budget and they want to hire someone, and the company decides how much effort will they invest. And I'll give you an example. When we were, we're hiring people, when we're hiring a staff engineer, which is really hard to find, we will invest our time into that. So we're, we're not going to give them a, a, a coded elite test at first. We're going to bring them out to lunch. We're going to have them meet the team. Uh, where we might not even do coding, we'll, we'll, we'll bring, if we have strong references and all, all of those things, and we'll do a super nice process because they're so damn hard to get and you don't want to mess it up. When we hire interns and we have four places and the minute we open the requisition online, we get 500 applicants, you know, we could have a really great experience with all of them and we could have an engineer talk with them. My engineer on, on a team of 20 people would do no work for two weeks and they would have a great experience and we'd still only hire four. So then... It's, it's a bit of a buyer, and a buyer and seller market. Like We will put an automated test, which we know is not great, but it gives more people the chance to go through. So it's a continuous trade-off. And going back to, to hiring people, I, I'm a big believer at getting a sense of the skills that you cannot change so, or, or that you don't have time to change. And this is typically, can you just compile a program? I do like to give people chances otherwise. And I think my, my belief, something I wish I've done, well, I would have done better but I was a little bit in the machine, is, is being, uh, giving people chances but focusing on the onboarding. So instead of just saying, like, hey, most companies for software engineers say, we want to hire this engineer and we want them to perform from day one, so we'll, we'll be conservative. We'll say oh, no to all these people who are almost there. Instead, hire that person, give them that support, uh, help them succeed, and just be frank with them, saying, like, look, I, I think you're missing this thing your first three months, you need to get better. And I think we'll be at a lot better place, less frustrating uh, experiences, and we'll slowly get there. But biggest thing is, you know, experiment. Uh, do not accept what is out there. Big tech will not change. They will keep doing what is working for them because it's working and they can. And I, I've been in there. It's really hard to change. I, I tried it. So know that there's there. So if you're designing, a, do not copy them. Do something that's better. Do something where you would enjoy. And when you're an interviewer or on the panel, suggest stuff. Like, I, I think this is BS. Let's throw out the algorithm question. Cool. Let's experiment. Let's see what happens. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. So you talked a bit about staff engineers and hiring, et cetera. This split between moving down the managerial path and moving far more down the IC route, um, big tech are much more developed in their, uh, I guess, appreciation, establishment, and formalization of that internal ladder. How do you think about the split between those two? And how do you think about what generally tends to be a bias that people believe that they have to move down a management path to progress their career as an engineer? The interesting thing about big tech is they have a dual ladder because they can and, and they need to. And it, it also sounds very good. And, and also, it's very smart. Big tech has done some really, really cool things. And I say big tech, but it's, it's Google. Google started this and everyone copied. Like, like it's Uber was a lot of Google alumni, so we copied a lot of things. because it, it made sense for us, by the way. So we were similar size and similar challenges. But what they did, what they do really, really well, and I think what everyone needs to do is, first of all, the worst thing you can have is a bad manager. Well, the second worst thing you can have. The, the worst thing you can have is a bad manager for software engineers because they're so damn hard to hire. You get a bad manager in place, and I've seen this, by the way. You hire a bad manager, and they destroy the whole team. I'm not kidding. Like, like they, will, they will put someone on a pip that they shouldn't have to. I don't know why. Then half the team leaves, the other team, half the team transfers, and then like you need to fire this manager. It's, it's, it's just crazy. It's, it's 10 perfectly capable engineers, and all of them have a trauma. So the worst thing you want to do is have a bad ma software engineering manager. And you know, what do most companies do, like traditional companies? They will promote the senior engineer to become a manager. A terrible idea. So this is why big tech and any other sensible company figures out, hold on, First of all, let's not make this a promotion. Let's, let's not give managers more money who become managers. Let's actually pull up senior engineers to the same level of pay, roughly, or, or like senior two or whatever engineers. And let's gently introduce them to this. First of all, let's only get people into management who actually just seem to like doing this, seem like to, to mentor. Their team already likes them. They're kind of acting in that role. Let's give them support and training, and let's give them a safe way back. Let's not change their salary and tell them after six months, hey, 
do you want to do this? And it's totally okay if not. And this is a, a key thing. Some of the best staff engineers I've seen have been managers for a year or two. They, they did the job. They liked it, but they didn't love it. And they came back, and they were a lot better engineers for it. So I think this is what we're going to cultivate. And actually, I, I, I've been talking with Ivan, and I was really impressed on how you're doing this. And I'm actually impressed with a couple of things that Travel Perk is doing that is not typical in Europe. It, it, it will be same old, same old in Silicon Valley, but we're, we're still not Silicon Valley, and I'm seeing a lot of things. So this is one of those things. Uh, and I would suggest to any of you, like if, if you're sitting here and you're, you're anywhere in tech as an individual contributor, I, it's likely that in five, 10 years, when you have five, 10 years experience at some point, someone will walk up to you and say like, hey, do you want to be a team leader or a manager? Just because seniority is growing so fast, there's so many new people and, and you'll be you know, one of the older ones on the team in terms of experience. My, my advice to people is, a lot of people are like, ah, I'm not sure if I want to do that in management. I, I used to, you know, I, I bad mouth managers, I don't want to be one. It's going to be hard to do. My advice is, consider giving it a go for two reasons. First of all, you don't realize how hard these opportunities come by at non-fast growing companies. I have people messaging me at companies that are stagnating, that they've been there for five years, they really want to try out management, but there's no one, and their manager will just not quit. And even when they quit, they hire someone else, they don't promote him, uh, or, or like you know, give him that thing. So it's not many opportunities. Second, you can only win from this as long as you can go safely back. You'll figure out, like, am I good at this? You'll also figure out why your manager wasn't that big of an idiot <laughs> as you thought they would. And, and even if you, and you might decide that you like it and you like helping people. That's where I was. I actually realized I didn't know if I would be a good manager, but I, I realized I liked doing it. So I did it for a couple of years and I learned a lot. And when you go back, you will be so much better of an engineer. You'll be, a, be able to be a partner to managers. You'll be able to explain to people like, you know, behind the scenes. And you've just seen how the sausage is made. And it's not pretty, but, you know, sometimes you need that. Okay, I'm going to dive into questions now because I can see a bunch of nodding heads and a bunch of engaged, interested people. So I'm going to give you all a chance to throw questions at Gergi. So do we have another microphone or do we need my one? Um, I'm happy to... I'll start sacrificing and if we find another one, then we'll... Okay, I'll st I've got one question up there. Do you, do you want to start? And then I'll do that one in a second. So what you just said about uh, engineering managers, uh, in Travel Perk we have a concept of a squad lead, just like a tech lead for a certain squad. Does that, uh, does that advice about going into a position for a year or two and then seeing how you like it still apply? Um, how would you go around that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think you know, squad lead, tech lead, manager, it, it's similar things. It's taking on more responsibility, needs some more soft skills. If you if you're on the fence of, am I ready? Give it a go and also work with your manager. Like Ask for feedback from them. Uh, and the nice thing about becoming a manager or a squad lead with a group of people you know, they trust you. And it, it's kind of tough because when you become a, like you have this authority now or this title and you will get less feedback, but it's a lot better. The worst thing that I think you can do or the hardest thing to become a manager is join a company to become a manager when you've never done it before. You will be so out of your depth. Again, you can succeed, I'm not saying, but it's a lot safer. So yes, it applies. Yeah, I guess um, this whole like Europe to um, Silicon Valley sort of concept. Um, I just wondered, like, to what extent do you think that we have more winners in Silicon Valley because the first tech companies were in Silicon Valley, and therefore people are just backing who they perceive to be winners? So, as in, are those companies actually better than the companies in Europe, or are they just being backed? Therefore, they have more money. Therefore, they have better employees. Therefore, they're always going to actually. Um, or they're more likely to become more successful. And if you think it is the case, then in Europe, how do we get to the situation where people are actually being the good companies are actually being backed to the same level as the companies in Silicon Valley? Yeah, so it's, it is a good question, and success will always breed success, of course. But the question is like, can you change it? And, and I think there's two reasons that Silicon Valley is working the way it does. First of all, they well, a few reasons, but I'll, I'll just say the, the biggest ones. One of them, there's a community. There's people, if, if you're living there, you can actually get mentorship from, from people around who've kind of been at similar places, which, and, and they've kind of done similarly high growth things. So if, if you're scaling up, like you'll have a bunch of people. And that expertise is slowly spreading. The, uh, the other part is they also very much, they, they have these tax breaks. So employees make a bunch of money and they encourage those employees, like you can just take the money, but you pay a lot of tax. And instead, they do encourage reinvesting some of those things. So that also helps. The biggest thing that I, I like how we can catch up is well, first, we do need success stories. We have success stories. 
Second is we need equity, like employees need equity. And a lot of you will just be rolling your eyes on, you know, travel perk issuing equity and it's funny money and you can't really cash it or whatever. But if, and I, I don't know, like, I, I don't know if this company will go, go public and be a unicorn or a decacorn, I, I don't know. But if it does, all of you will be wishing that you would have had that. And it's not just on your end, by the way, it's on the founders who are giving it. So the best founders give equity no matter what to, 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 to some amount to make sure that's there. So we need the two of them because if we have more success stories, people appreciate more equity, they have the funds to start their own companies. We just need more, more and more startups for people who are staying here. And as, as compensation slowly goes up, which is happening right now, thanks to a lot of US companies actually, people also stick around. So we, we've had a brain drain from Europe. I know some amazing engineers in, in Europe who are all at now Pinterest and Google and all in Silicon Valley because they, they would have stayed for like half the, the money, but they were able to actually make more. And I think we can potentially slowly reverse this, but you know, I think focus on, on the, one, the couple of things that you can do. First of all, if, if, you, if you can give back to someone and mentor them, do that. Like, like as, uh, people who are starting out, they're absolutely friggin' clueless. They, 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 they know nothing of what we've talked about at all. And, and the other thing is, do prioritize companies who give you equity on top of a fair salary. It's not just that, there's other things as well, but all things being equal, get yourself that lottery ticket. You might get lucky. I got, I got really lucky with Uber, I'm glad I did. Hopefully a lot of you will, will get lucky either here or elsewhere because there will be a lot of these companies going public which, which do bleed out some of those things that we can all benefit from and the ecosystem benefits from. The easiest way to fund the company, have a good exit where you, you were part of a company that IPO'd, you will have no problem raising your seed round for like a couple million dollars because they, they know that you've done it and you actually have the experience even if you don't believe you do. Awesome. Next question. I think we've got someone down here unless we have someone with the mic. Yeah. Hi. This feels like a silly question after everyone else's brilliant questions but there's a book called uh, The Pragmatic Programmer and it's one of those, oh it changed my life. It's the only programming book that changes, changed the way I think about programming. I just wondered if the pra pragmatic engineer was a reference to the book, The Pragmatic Programmer. So it, it, it wasn't, I guess maybe partially, like it was interesting because I, I, I never finished The Pragmatic Programmer book. I, I started reading it and I just didn't like the style of it as much. Like it, it has, it starts with the reference of the cat ate my source code and I looked through the table of contents and it, it was, it, it didn't speak to me. And again, don't get me wrong, I, I know it's a really good book and, and, and they spent a lot of things. When I started to write my, my blog, I, I kind of thought like, well, they wrote some really cool stuff like, I'll want to write about, about programming, I want to write about software engineering. And I just liked the, the book, sorry, sorry, not the book, I, I liked the, the name, the, the verb, pragmatic. It, it wasn't a, a direct reference. Uh, I did reach out to the pragmatic programmers about my, my next book that I'm still writing, saying, hey, do you want, I could write something about this? But in the end, they said no, so we're, we're not going to go there. But again, it is a great, what I love about that book, uh, in the sense that even though it didn't resonate fully with me, two of, of the engineers uh, or the developer or programmers who wrote that they spent two years to kind of distill all their wisdom. And I'm, I'm writing a book that I've been writing for two years. Again, it's, it's not copying or, or anything like that. Uh, We'll, we'll see if it'll be more of my thoughts on this. So, so yeah, I, I wish, by the way, we had more of those books that are just a bit of a like, oh, here's something that I've seen over blog posts. I, I don't think enough people do that because we have so many people who have a lot to share. And, and this is why I'm encouraging a lot of you to just write things because it will resonate with other people as well. Can you tell us what the book is? It's, uh, the, the name is A Software Engineer's Guidebook. And it's, it's, it's been in the works for a long time. I, I work with a traditional publisher for like half a year or so. It's one of these big projects that I, I really want to get out. And it, it's my view on what I think, uh, what my observations are on these kind of fast moving startups and large tech companies. What is a software engineer, senior engineer, a staff engineer? And what are what is some advice that I, I could, like if, if I sat down and I, and I mentored a lot of these people at Uber, I actually helped them grow all the way to staff level. Like, you know, what would I tell them? And because I, I do think that the world has changed. And like a, a lot of the older literature, like it, it's, it's no longer programming, it's no longer individual heroism. It's a lot more collaborative. You need to be aware of the business a lot more to actually succeed. If you look at some of the highest paying jobs in terms of uh, the, you know, the Silicon Valley jobs, the Googles, whatnot, what they do all day, it's, it's actually, they're not even writing code all that much. There's all the tooling. Uh, it, 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 it's, it feels like it, you need to be a bit of an entrepreneur 
to succeed in, in, in these places and come up with these, uh, these cool ideas that become business impact that you know generate billions of dollars at some point. And you actually started that. It's, it's crazy how much opportunity we have in, in tech. It's, it's just ridiculous. I, I think it's a great place to be in. Last question, Roberto, make it count. <laughs> yeah, another question about uh, innovation. Uh, the many times is about uh, trying new stuff, uh, trying new ideas. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it depends on serendipity and you just uh, stumble upon uh, an idea that, uh, that the flourish. And, uh, and some companies do it in the form of hackathons or uh, internal competitions or uh, time dedicated to just trying out things. I wanted to um, ask you about your experience and your ideas about how an engineering team can uh, uh, bring innovation um, uh, to the table. I mean, I, I think the simple, like, I usually feel people ask about innovation and, and they kind of hope that you can answer and say like, oh, if you do a hackathon, it'll all be good. Or if you do this week of something. And the truth is like, those things are, are fun and you should do it for the fun of it. They're, they're not going to solve innovation program like a oh, problem or, or the lack of innovation. What is going to solve it is have your engineers sit where the business problems are. Have, if it's customer, have them sit next to customer support for a week. Uh, remove the barriers. Uh, have product managers. And well, and you know now with, with partial remote, it's a bit, bit more difficult. The most innovation happens when you lock people together who should who are usually not together. At Uber, some of our biggest innovations happened when the operations team, who were the people running the, the show in, on the ground hiring drivers, they came to engineers and, and they told them all the stuff that was driving them crazy. Like it's, I, th I think that's very simple. That being said, with hackathons, I, I think it's a good way to let out the steam. I think you want to mix it up. You might get some, some unexpected stuff from it, but uh, like, I, I don't think we should expect that like, hey, a hackathon will, will create the next big thing for, for the company unless you're, you, you have like some sort of, unless you bring in these other people and unless it's not just the week, but you actually like give some sort of time to do it. So like, yeah, try out new stuff, but the best way, and by the way, as a software engineer, if, if you're looking for business impact and if you want to innovate and want to have fun, talk with non-software engineers, talk with the data scientist, the designer, have a one-on-one -on -one with your product manager. How many of you have one-on-ones with your product managers? Like, when was the last time you had a one-on-one? -on -one? Just, just pull them and say, hey, like, do you have 30 minutes? Uh, I'd love to learn a bit about what you do because I'm just interested. And also the business, you know, like from, from all the way to customer support. It's, it's easier said than done, I know that, but challenge yourself once a quarter, four times a year, grab a lunch or, or, or try to catch up, like you know, remote preventing or, or allowing with someone who is not an engineer at the company. And I guarantee you'll learn so much. That's actually one of my secrets that I did at Uber. I, I, I sat to people I didn't know at the lunch table and, and we had everyone not just engineering there, so I learned so much. Awesome, can I have a massive round of applause for Gogo, please? <laughs> Thank you very much, Gergi. Okay, so we're going to have lunch, but before we go and eat, I think, Miriam, you asked if we could do some housekeeping. Um, I think everybody should have a form. I don't know if it's on your table or not. Miriam, do you want to keep me honest here? If you do. Do you have forms? Can you sign it? Is it signed? Do, I think, okay, this is basically giving you a, a room to, to sleep in tonight. I'm not asking for anything else. It's not, not under some disclaimer to give me your kidney or something. Um, so I think the instructions are with this sign, and then at your leisure, take it to the reception and demand accommodation in a polite travel perk way. Okay, fantastic. Let's go eat.